And I was just, I was like, you know what? Fuck it. I'm done. And I took a deep breath and I was like, the compulsion to do drugs was lifted from me. Hey, JP in the house. The Wolf is here for the Wolf's Den and other great podcasts. This is a special one. I have a two on, I mean, double teamed here. Okay, mom and daughter <laughs> combination here. I got a legend. I got Jen Black, who's been, well, we just, I just found out. She's like been in either TV or radio since she's like, like was in diapers. Not four, four years old, right? Oh, yeah. Four years old. Yeah. Okay, so you're out of diapers, I think, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I hope. We hope, I hope so, <laughs> I right? <guess. laughs> if you wasn't, we have issues, right? And then we have our daughter, Laura Owens, who's also awesome. They do a, and they have a podcast they do together. Uh, it's, um, it's got really 4.9 stars. It was really popular. It was the number one self-help podcast uh, for many weeks. Is it still or has it been, been off and on? It has been off and on. Yeah, it's so, off and on. Yeah, it's it very, very popular. Year. And they're, they're really awesome. And, they, and I think for them, it's mostly a labor of love. It's something that's really authentic for them. It's not like, you know, I'm sure they do well with it financially, but it wasn't about that. It's more about they, they do it because they love doing it and great story to tell. And, um, and I also want you to know that Anytime you want to ask me any questions, I know you guys do interviews, so don't think it's just a one way. I want to have a dialogue with you guys yeah, and perfect. nothing's off limits both ways, right? Perfect. Yeah, absolutely. Perfect. So I want to start by saying, okay, what were you doing at four years old? That's okay. number one. <laughs> okay. So at four years- I want to ask you what year it was in. I mean, it but, was, okay. The year would have been 1960. <laughs> okay. The year was okay. 1960. Right. Okay. And uh, I, I watched a television, a local kids' TV show in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where I grew up. Right. Begged my mother, could I be on the show? Could I be on the show? Because they had an announcement saying we need more kids for the show. So my mother said, yeah, okay, okay, okay. And drove me down for an audition, and I got on the show. And so I was on it for, I don't know, a few months or so, and then the show went off the air. Right. But, uh, so that, what, what did you do on the show, though? Like, what it, was was just, it was just a, a kid show with, like, six kids doing different things. Do you remember like, when we were growing up, One Dorama, remember that? Like, the, uh, they, the, do, you, do you remember that show, One Dorama? One Dorama. I don't, I'm not familiar maybe it's, with maybe, that. Maybe it's an East Coast thing. Maybe, that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the kids would all wave their hands back and forth. I mean, we lived in a different, we grew up in a different world. I'm, cl <laughs> right. I'm close to your age, right? Right, so right. Oh, yeah. Very, it, yeah. Exactly. It was such a, such a big thing. But uh, yeah, I got the bug then, and then um, just really wanted to be in TV and radio, and and got back into it in a serious way when I was a teenager. When there was a real pull, um, a real push for women in broadcasting in the in the seventies, because there weren't many, and you know there was a real push to get women hired in broadcasting. So I thought, well. Let me try it again. And, and where so were you living could, back then? Again, in, it was in Albuquerque, New Mexico. So it was a smaller market. And I think in a lot of ways, it was easier to break in because it mm -hmm. wasn't New York. It wasn't Los Angeles. It was a smaller market and you could make mistakes, you know, right, right. you can make your mistakes in small towns. And so, so that was it. And got into radio and TV there. Moved to San Francisco. Moved to San Francisco. <laughs> well, that, right. So, so now then you came into the picture, yeah. right? So, so tell Fast me the story now, right? <laughs> yeah. So now, okay. So now you guys, um, so you grew up in San Francisco, right? Yes. Born and raised in San Francisco. Um, my parents met in radio. So my dad has been on the radio for 40 some years. So what does he, what does he um, do in on San Francisco? What's like the, what's, what does he do is on the base, is his own talk show? He has a talk show. He's now doing a briefer news commentary because my dad's in his seventies now. So he still wants to be on the air, but he also wants to kind of retire. So I would say he's semi-retired at right. this point. Right. And he has Parkinson's disease. He's yes. had Parkinson's for 18 years. And so he kind of wanted to pull back from the mm -hmm. daily the daily mm -hmm. talk show. But he's still he's on the air every day doing a, mm -hmm. a segment. How, a how commentary. Got, how, I think the treatments have gotten much more effective, right? So I think the prognosis mm -hmm. used to be much worse than it is now. Oh right? yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he's had deep brain stimulation surgery. Mm -hmm. which is real cutting edge. Michael J. Fox had that, right? Yeah, I remember. So uh, it's uh, it's amazing what it mm -hmm. can do. I mean, mm -hmm. he's he's functioning. He's, you know, yeah, and he's working living a normal day, life. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's, yeah. he really awesome. is. Yeah, yeah, he is. But I think it's I like got the, the... The glial cells are something they stimulate, right, in the certain part of the brain. It's pretty amazing right. the things they do. It is. It, it's absolutely amazing. And they can adjust it too. He was at the doctor yesterday and they can adjust it. They can make his voice sound slower, make it faster and... Really? Give it a little more edge. Oh, it's yeah. real, it's they, amazing they what they can do. They just fine tune it. With yeah. a, he's got a battery pack in his chest mm -hmm. and electrodes in his brain. And, mm -hmm. and, and, it's, and he had yeah. a really bad tremor before, and it's completely gone. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah. Unbelievable. They can fix mm-hmm. it like that. So. So it's a it's an implant that he actually yeah. that, that's constantly mm-hmm. used. Exactly. Is it running all the time or only when he has tremors? All the time. Un- yeah, all, all the time. time. And it makes it like Laura said, so that he absolutely has no tremor whatsoever. It's, it, it's like you know, it's like it's like it's a, I think it works like noise cancellation technology, like mm-hmm, where, mm-hmm, where like you have mm-hmm. headphones, right? It and it, 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 it yeah. gives you the they take the amplitude and they give the exact one, and it, mm-hmm. like, and it almost cancels it out, right? So mm-hmm, they, it's mm-hmm. really amazing. Mm-hmm. I love. I'm a tell science buff, by the way. I'm a closet nerd. Oh, really, really, mm-hmm. really. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I want, my mother wanted me to be a doctor. So. Oh wow! Did you ever wow. study medicine then? Oh yeah, well, I went to. I, well, I spent I spent one day in dental school. <laughs> <laughs> but I have a bio degree in biochemistry, so I uh-huh. studied in college. And no, I, yeah. it's like um, it's one of those things. That like if I'm in an airport and I'm gonna mm-hmm. need retina, I'll go to the. I uh, believe it or not, I'll go and buy like you know science, uh, mm-hmm. American uh-huh. scientific, or really? yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I love that discovery, and I watch the uh, stuff on TV. Yeah, I just I really enjoy, I do enjoy it. I research mm-hmm. on the internet for whatever reason. You know, yeah. Yeah. it's like a puzzle to figure out. Mm-hmm. I think it's right. the human body is an amazing thing. And mm-hmm. all these developments in medicine too are so interesting. And I think we follow it more closely because of my dad, but. You know, it's just crazy to see all these. Yeah, no, it's a, and I, th- oh. I, I think on many levels, I, I treated my own body like a Petri dish. <laughs> and then I, balancing out all the drugs. So like I learned to become a responsible addict. So, hey, so Laura, <laughs> tell me about you, okay? So okay. You're, you're, you're very successful, right? So you have this podcast with your mom, right? Yes. What was the... Um, why did you first? Of all, you know what was what was the, uh, the impetus to start it? It's not. It's a very. I don't think it's a pretty calm. I I couldn't. By the way, I could not having a, imagine having a podcast with my. Well, see the equivalent. My dad. Oh my god, from Mad Max from the movie. <laughs> yes, uh, yes, yes, yes. Mad Max is not easy. You know what I'm saying? You know. <laughs> well, I feel he's, like it, it could have gone either way, he's, right? He's tough. <laughs> but but I, what's it, what's it like working with your mom? I mean, I think we get along really well, and that mm-hmm. was why we decided to start the podcast in the first place. Was we listen to all these podcasts on our own. We would be listening individually to podcasts and then we would be together in the car driving mm-hmm. all the time mm-hmm. and we would listen to self-help podcasts. We went to Tony Robbins together. Like we were very interested in the self-help field. Uh-huh. And I think my interest really was sparked by the fact that I had depression and I was trying to hide the fact that I had depression from my friends. And right. you know, if you were to see my social media from a few years ago, I mean, you would just think I had everything together and you know, I was really living the life. And at, you know, at the, at that time I was really struggling and I was listening to these podcasts when I would be home at night, I would just be like, God, I just, I just want to feel better. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting. I, I, think it's so true it's, it's it's i think it's problematic that people they they post this sort of artificial represent it's like mm-hmm. you know like you say when you mm-hmm. go on your first date mm-hmm. you send your representative it's not the real person exactly right. they, six, right. months, six months later they meet who you are right right like, who the fuck are you <laughs> right. why are you change i didn't change really well. <laughs> right yeah. right yeah but uh, yeah. on social media like everyone's happy everyone's uh-huh. smiling every uh-huh. pictures are altered mm-hmm. right photoshop whatever it might be it's right it's gotten mm-hmm. worse and and it's mm-hmm. kind of screwed up because it, it could you know i think that you're almost measuring your own happiness against some artificially pumped up image of right, what happiness right. is, right? Right. And it's like, even though you know that's and happening. And even though you know it's true, it doesn't change it, the it fact. It really right. doesn't change the fact that when I would be really, Watching really depressed, the, I get it. I'd be on my Instagram seeing everybody else's lives and it's hard to pull yourself away from, mm-hmm. from even looking at that. Mm-hmm. And at the time I was in a very abusive relationship, physically and emotionally abusive. And that made it even worse to yeah. see all of my friends seeming Apparently so happy. Apparently happy, right? Uh-huh. Right, uh-huh. right. It, why do you think that is though? I mean, like, I, it's Because it's a good point that we all, I think everyone knows mm-hmm. that it's bullshit, that, that, that the representation mm-hmm. isn't real, but yet it right. still affects us. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. why do you mm-hmm. think that is? And, you know, I also was going to say, too, I think for my mom's generation now, it's also the same thing that, you know, your friends are posting, oh, their kids are graduating and they're going on vacation. Right. And <laughs> Yeah, but you know what? I, di- I I disagree with you that it's all, all you know, roses and happy mm-hmm. stuff with my generation mm-hmm. because my generation, I think, also is using social media, like talking about some of the – the challenges they're mm-hmm. facing, you know. I don't know how many of my friends will post like, "Oh, my husband got sick, or my mother died." Well, it's or- hard for us to post pictures when we're looking good and happy. <laughs> right. I got a couple of good years left. Right. She's got. I mean, she's easy for her. Right. You know? uh, I got a little yeah. fucking plastic surgeon. Right? You know? right. Right. So no, but it's a good point right. though. Yeah. But I think I think our generation is maybe more honest about that stuff because maybe we've we've been through the years of phoniness yeah. and and mm-hmm. and people trying to be pe- who they who they aren't. And so now they feel yeah. like, okay, I can be honest. I can say, you know what? I mean, I've had I've had friends of mine post like, wow, you know what? We're really.
really struggling mm-hmm. financially yeah. right now. And and it's like, wow, you? How, how did that happen right. to you? you right. Know? Or you do have people who will say that a family member's sick and they need prayers. And then I think it's right. good. And I especially find with friends my age that I really, I really kind of admire those people who are yeah. brave enough to say that. Mm-hmm. And I think that it's gotten better. What do you, th- what do you think? What years. do you think it is though? Like, I mean, I think it's interesting that mm-hmm. that that we. I think most people know it's not real a lot, but why mm-hmm. does he think it still bothers? Why do you think mm-hmm. we still measure ourselves against that? Because it's visuals. Like, I mean, it's yeah, almost like you know, so. like, like at some level, like you think like you missed, like the people will see like, oh, there was a party last night. Mm-hmm. Everyone was there. Uh-huh. You know, you know right. what I mean? Right. Fear of missing out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. It's weird, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh-huh. It yeah. is really weird. And I think, you know, it's it's just so easy to go to your phone when you're bored and look at that stuff. You know, whereas I mm-hmm. guess maybe, you know, when your guys' generation, you guys didn't have the ability to no, do we, that. Yeah, yeah. It's like, you know it's not real, but you just can't help yourself from looking at it sometimes. You know that when phones first became popular, so I had a cell phone in nineteen. 19- in 1985. Wow. Because mm-hmm. in my first business, I thought I was making a lot of money. Actually, I was in the verge of going bankrupt. Didn't know it because I was my mm-hmm. first, you know, young entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but but I got a car. I got a brand new Porsche 928 S4. And I was uh-huh. 22, 122. It came with a car phone, right? Oh, and one of those wow. old. It was like one that was on a swimming that they want to stick, and you pulled uh-huh. it right. It was big, yeah. One, right? Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. And then I got the first bill. It was like three thousand dollars, and I pull the thing out of it, like, I'm like, fuck this, you know? And I, oh I was freaked out, right? And then, it, so then I didn't have a phone for many years. But then when I, even when I got really wealthy, I was like in my, in my early 30s, I was like, I was like, ah, who would want a phone? I, I, I remember yeah. like being a holdout. Like, huh. the, and, right. and now I couldn't imagine living without it. It's really yeah. weird, right? Yeah. You yeah. know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so for, for your generation, right? You're, are, you, you're a, are you a pure millennial? Pure millennial. Yes. Define what? Okay. So tell me what, what, what's the, give me the age. What's a, in your eyes as a millennial, what is a millennial and what's not? Who's before you and who's after you? I think it's like 1985 to 2000, I would say. Okay. Um, or people in my generation. I mean, we, we kind of grew up with the same things, I would say. Um, and I think we just have a very different attitude about life. I think that, you know, in some ways it's great and we're entrepreneurs and we're really driven. But on the other hand, I think there's also, a lot of people who are fake and it, mm-hmm. it yeah. you so, know. So, and millennials, you'd say they already are in like their second year of college or, they, or they're already in college, right? In college or they're out. What would you call the people below them? How would you try? Tra- I think that's generation Z. Is Z that right? Is it I think it's Z. I, I should know. I think it's mm-hmm. Z. Yeah. Or is that a, there is that a gender now? Gender Z. <laughs> <laughs> I understand the world. I'm getting, I'm right. getting fucking it's- nervous. <laughs> I go to see my parents and they're like, what is this stuff? I don't understand. And I saw this study today. You might be interested in this from a scientific standpoint oh, that, yeah. that, um, young people in Australia were, had some I just sort got of back there two days ago. Oh, really? Oh, wow. oh, I'm yeah. jealous. Yeah, I was I'm just jealous. there. Well, apparently these kids are getting bone spurs in the back of their head from looking down so much at their phones. No. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, that doesn't surprise yeah, me. Yeah, and that is oh. that's so scary. I mean, how yeah. much wow. how much time are they spending on these phones? Mm-hmm. It's interesting. They're, They're even worse than millennials. Everyone was so, so worried that you know you get brain cancer. It turns out it's bone right. spurs. Right. Is the, yeah, right, is, <laughs> exactly. The, the, they yeah. died of bone spurs. <laughs> you know. So so now let me. So so okay. So you're a millennial, right? Yes. So okay, that's the. So give me your. What's the definition? Forget the not 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 the time. What do you? Mm-hmm. How would you describe a millennial? I would say that we are, you know, like I said, just like a really driven group who grew up kind of in the last innocent generation. So we kind of know about life before phones and life before computers. We know how to be outside, but we also know what it's like to be in the modern world with technology and mm. using our smartphones all the time. So I think we're really the ideal generation. Mm. <laughs> Sorry, you guys. I think we are. Let me tell you my take. Okay? Yeah, yeah. So, and I want to hear yours as well. Because your kids but, are millennials, Yeah, you right? are, right? So I, I think millennials get a really bad rap for no reason. Yes, they mm-hmm. do. Okay, like that they're lazy. I have almost all millennials work. I mean, they're the best, hardest working mm-hmm. I have a, an unbelievable team. They're all in that age group. Right, I mean, right. And I went through my share of losers to get to this. You yeah, know, higher, but that's always the case. Uh-huh. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. And I, and I, I don't, I, I wonder why. I, I, and you know what it is? I, I think that's like, it's always the people, like there's always a small group that yells mm-hmm. the loudest. Right. So I think there is an entitled group of millennials, but it's a very really tiny mm-hmm. fraction of mm-hmm. them uh-huh. that, 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 you know, whatever you call them, the social justice warriors, whatever they are, mm-hmm. where it seems like they want, you know, something for nothing or right. it's all about like, you know, you know, give me because I exist. And I, but I think it's a really tiny sliver of them. And yet for some reason they all get 
Do you know? Do you, do you know? So like, I think that millennials get painted with that sort of oh, millennials. It's hard to make them work. I mean, right, you know, you right, know? right. Mm-hmm. And it's like I haven't found that at all. Right, then that small group makes it so hard for me. I feel like I have to justify. I'm a millennial, but uh-huh. I'm a hard worker. Uh-huh. I- my, my, I'm t- I see the exact opposite. Yeah. My millennials, all right, and they're all yeah. millennials, pretty right. much mm-hmm. yeah. ninety percent of them, and, and they work long hours. Yeah, but like the the, dif- the difference is, is they the, the things the, I I think just knowing human nature and management, mm-hmm. I make sure the environment is fun and exciting and conducive mm-hmm. to them, mm-hmm. almost like they're all in business for themselves here in one way. Right. Like they're yeah, all yeah. growing and learning and they have a lot of authority. And if they do well, they immediately rise up. So uh-huh. I, I think that in some level, they, they don't want to be cubbyhole. Like I think it's right. like this, right? It's like not, not that they are not willing to work hard because they are. Mm-hmm. And I don't, I don't think they expect instant advancement. Mm-hmm. I think what we want though is to be, they, they like to be tested in the sense of given responsibility. And they mm-hmm. I think they work well like that. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. But I think they also want something they want ownership of what they're doing exactly they want, mm-hmm. they want motivation to work harder 100%. they're not happy just living you know in the same apartment they've lived in for 10 years they want to move up they want to buy the house they want a, they want to own their own company right yeah. that's right. really what i find right yeah but you know what when you're talking about they want to own their own company there's so much talk in san francisco especially about millennials working for startups and the mm-hmm. idea being that oh well, all these millennials are working for startups they're all making a million dollars overnight mm-hmm. and yeah. and i think that that must make the ones who aren't which the majority yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, the majority yeah. the, feel bad yeah. the, the reality though is that that's completely False in the, uh-huh. in the sense that they're not uh-huh. making millions overnight. What mm-hmm. happens yeah. is you hear these extreme success stories mm-hmm. about like one company, I mean, not just one, but you know mm-hmm. some companies that will take and people get stock options, right? Mm-hmm. For course. the most part, that's that's very rare. If you were right. to do the mm-hmm. percentages, I mm-hmm. think the difference is that you know when we were growing up, right? It was more about like we would the the, the story that we were told by society was that go work at a big company, uh-huh. mm-hmm. get a safe job, work, get a pension. Mm-hmm. Right. Oh, exactly. and, and between your pension and social security, you know, you'll be, you'll mm-hmm. able to retire. And I think mm-hmm. that everyone now knows social security is bankrupt. Mm-hmm. It'll be mm-hmm. enough to pay for your diapers when you're in a nursing home if you're lucky. <laughs> right. And if things get bit, you get bitch slapped by the nurse there, right. For a, It's going to get pretty bad. So yeah. I think the millennials, I think in some level, they, they realize they have to be more empowered mm-hmm. because that social safety isn't real. And I, I don't, and I don't think it really ever was real. I, uh-huh. I, I think that, that, the information was hard to come by back in the, like, you know, cause look at, I mean, you must know a lot of my parents' friends, they're, they're almost, I mean, thankfully, you know, my, my parents are doing well because I made a lot of money in the, uh-huh. in, back mm-hmm. when I did and my dad worked for me, as you know, right? Mm-hmm. But a lot of their friends really, you know, mm-hmm. they, they, they struggle in their mm-hmm. 70s and 80s. They right. did not have- Really struggling. They, yeah, the, and you said that you hear it some of your friends are posting things that they're struggling, yeah, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. But, you know, I think too, in, in my parents' generation, they grew up, um, you know, during the Depression, during World War II. Mm-hmm. And I think it was like, you want you want a safe situation. You want security. Right, you no weren't, you weren't my thinking- My parents you, yeah. yeah, you want Want, you weren't really thinking you needed to go out and be an entrepreneur. I mean, my dad was like, well, you get a job and you get a good job and you just stay in Opposite, that job exactly. and you get the gold right. watch and, and, and So what, so what do you it. think is different about my generation? Do you think we're grittier or have higher aspirations for ourselves or how has it changed? Well, I, I think the big aspect of your is that the access to information. So the, uh-huh, in other words, exactly. there's a huge difference that like when I was growing up, all right, you, you know, you, it was hard to be informed. You had to really mm-hmm. try. Mm-hmm. And even when you tried, you were only being fed information from a select group of newspapers mm-hmm. or, yeah. and, you know, we trusted Walter Cronkite and he was a legend. And then all of a sudden cable news came. So you had a couple of extra voices. And, mm-hmm. you know, I think today journalism is disgusting for most of it. It's all, mm-hmm. it's like, it's so polarized right. and, and, and it's really sad. Mm-hmm. Okay. What's mm-hmm. happened. But, but what, what's happened is those because of the internet, and because of, you know, you having this smartphone, which makes people smarter, is, is that, you know, there's really no excuse right now for someone to go through life and not be informed. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and because of that, I think you see the good, the bad, the ugly. You, you're fine. In other words, it, most people would take until you're in your 30s or mm-hmm. 40s to realize the truths about mm-hmm. success, mm-hmm. about life, about mm-hmm. um, what's a dead I think people are finding it out 20 years early right now. It's just saying, fuck, I got to, <laughs> right, I got to right. do something now. Right. I got to live yeah. my life now. I can't, no. that that's not, it's not true that, that, as you said, the gold watch one mm-hmm. place. So I think the millennials are saying, you know what? Hey, I, I want, I want to have, 
happiness now, but I want to have empower. I think it's about empowerment more than anything else, and I think that's mm -hmm. a, a big part of it. And and on the negative side, I mm -hmm. think there's a huge problem with um with this whole. You know, I don't know what you think about, but this whole you know university safe space generation, and mm -hmm. and I think mm -hmm. it's really problematic because the world's mm -hmm. not a safe place. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, and mm -hmm. I think that you know you grow go through you know universities and they're like, I don't know, it's, it just doesn't make sense to me because like, you know, the, you know I, I think people should be nice to each other yeah. and respectful, right. but the world is not, you know, a, an artificially mm -hmm. maintained safe space. There's, there's mm -hmm. good people, bad people, you have to learn. It's almost like, it's, it's almost like when you have a kid that, that gets sent off to college by his mm -hmm. parents and they were so overprotective. So what does the kid do when he goes, he becomes a binge drinker. Crazy. Of goes course. nuts. Because he didn't have a chance yeah. to actually right. exercise those muscles and break in, right? And then right. Right. versus... So uh, you know, maybe I was a little bit too liberal with my kids, but they were they think they ended up you know do, doing well. But mm -hmm. they sort of had that uh, they understood sort of that they you know what that was before they went away. So they're yeah. able to sort of step into it in a more rational way. Right, uh -huh. exactly, and I think that totally makes sense. I think that right now with my generation, I found that a lot of the kids have gone to college and were were so sheltered in high school, then they go to college and it's still a really sheltered, safe space. Like I have friends that went to USC and God forbid they step out of, you know, the immediate neighborhood right. of no, USC and then they're like, <laughs> ah, I don't know what to do. You know, one of the things we discussed before this, we're talking about the, the problem with homelessness, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. In, in, um, San, in San Francisco, Francisco, right? Yeah. You know, what are the causes? Is it is a political mm -hmm. right. failure? Mm -hmm. Is it a, a, is a situation of weather? You know, like, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's because mm -hmm. like on the East coast, you know, mm -hmm. I, you guys don't probably know this, but on the East coast, like when it's winter, Homeless people die sometimes. Sure. Like they, they were the sleep on subway, you know, grates when it gets really cold. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It doesn't get mm -hmm. cold here, right? Yeah. So right. One of the things I noticed, even before this became a, like so much into the public, um, you know, discussion. Yeah. And there was tons of homeless people in California here, mm -hmm. right. even way right. back 15 years ago. Right, mm -hmm. right. And now it's gotten worse. I think it's so it's a comp. What do you think about that in terms of like, is it political? Is there, any, is there a political element to it? I think I think there's a political element to it, but I also think there's a mental health element. I think that's mm -hmm. the biggest mm -hmm. thing. Mental health, you know, you have so many of these people who are homeless who really have mental health issues, who, who don't necessarily want to... Uh, you know, for whatever mental illness is involved, they don't want to be in a, a traditional housing situation. You know, mm -hmm. maybe but they also don't have the resources to get a job that's or going to get help. to keep a job, or, or yeah, you know, and, or to, or to, get and to get help, help yeah. for their mm -hmm. mental illnesses. And and then there are a lot of addiction issues. There, right. there are a lot of education issues. I mean, it's it's so complicated. It's really so complicated, and it has gotten so much worse in San Francisco. Well, well some of some of it dates back in terms of mental health. A lot of it has to do with with um, a change in thought in psychiatry and they, with the invention of antipsychotic drugs. Mm -hmm. So what happened mm -hmm. was back before they had like Thorazine and Haldol and before, before there was this new and, and there's other drugs as well for, for schizophrenia, what happened was is they had to, they lock, kept these people locked in homes. And then there was, I, th I forgot which president it was. It might have been Reagan. Okay. It might have been before that even, but there was this sort of school of thought that, you know what? Mm -hmm we can control their problems with medication mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they let me large amounts of people out of nursing, out of, out of institutions mm -hmm. thinking they could survive on the, uh, you know, in society. And what yeah. happened was is the side effects of these medications are pretty severe. Mm -hmm. So people don't want to get they stop taking. And also right. the weird thing is like, you think, you're normal when you're on the medication. You're like, oh, I don't need the medication. There's nothing wrong. It's almost like it mental illness is a weird thing like that. It tricks you into thinking that, you know, oh, what's really wrong with me? Like, like when you take mm -hmm. Xanax, oh, I'm not anxious anymore. Like, oh, I'm, I don't have anxiety, but right. it's exactly. Exactly, exactly the fucking, it's the fucking right. drug, right? Right, right. So, and right. I think there was a massive problem with, 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 um, with, um, you know, people that really belonged in institutions because they just simply could not mentally function out in the world, mm -hmm. but it saves money right. to have them give them a pill Mm -hmm. Right. Uh -huh. And put them on the street is much cheaper solution. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then also there's the, you know, the sort of the, the attitude here, especially very liberal in California. Yes. Right. Uh -huh. Yes. And, and New York as well, but I think more, even more so out here. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. What do you guys think about that? Yeah. Well, I think you're, I think you're absolutely right, but I'm wondering, I mean, you are, are so intelligent. What would you do to solve the problem? What would you do if you could wave a magic wand and, and fix the homeless problem in California? Mm, wow. First of all, I would not, I think it's a mis I think that uh, um you know listen I'm I'm socially liberal and fiscally conservative uh -huh. okay. right that's that's my basic uh -huh. you know more and more libertarian than anything uh -huh. okay I I think that number 1 I think that 
I think that the whole idea of sanctuary cities is a big mistake. Mm -hmm. uh, my personal opinion. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. um, I think it, it, it. I think that here's the okay. There's an economic reality, right? We can't afford our own people. Mm -hmm. Right. I would love to be generous and help everyone out, but mm -hmm. we can't afford our own people. So I think mm -hmm. there's a huge drain on the actual social welfare system right now mm -hmm. for people that that aren't citizens here. Mm -hmm. And because of that, there's not enough to actually direct the people who are. That's right. part of it. Mm -hmm. Not the whole problem. That's part right. of it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, and why have empathy for those people. Okay. Right. You know, you know, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm from the United States and I think that people that come here legally mm -hmm. should be, you know, and I, I, I think immigration is great. Mm -hmm. My parents are immigrants. So, right. Yeah. You know yeah. what I'm saying? But I, but I think that even if illegal immigrants are, taxing the system is very difficult. Then I think that's part of the problem. Mm -hmm. Another part of the problem, I think, is what I said before, that I think that they rely too much on medication as a, as a solution. And right. also the issue with, like, you know, allow, uh, let, me, let me give you an example, okay? Mm -hmm. um, in the 1980s, the United, uh, New York was a half city, was a mess, all right? Mm -hmm. Massive crime, mm -hmm. all right? You, um, you couldn't walk down the street. It was real, and Rudy Giuliani came in, and you could love him or hate him, but mm -hmm. he did something very interesting, okay? He, he started arresting people for quality of life, Issues like even squeegee kids were getting and and mm -hmm. minor and what ha it's interesting and and what happened was it caused a rapid decrease in crime and livability in the streets because if the police are not allowing it to happen, all right, it stops. When I think yeah. what happens, it starts when you when you allow things everyday quality of life. If there's people in the mm -hmm. streets, like I, I and listen, I don't I haven't been there to see it with my own eyes, yeah. but mm -hmm. from what I see on TV mm -hmm. and I I. Every day I, I watch Fox. I'll watch um, a regular news channel that's not that's not conservative. I'll read the New York Times. I, I make sure, because I don't want to be an echo chamber. Right, yeah, right. right. Oh, so exactly. I, so I, try, I make yeah. sure I really get a well-rounded view, because no. if you just watch Fox, okay, then you, you get one view. I want to have all views, right? Because mm -hmm. uh -huh. I, I think part of, by the way, the internet, and especially social media, is they make it into an echo chamber. Uh -huh. The right. algorithms, oh, oh, yeah. I think it's oh, really my God. destructive. I'm crazy, and yeah, I think right? that's gotten worse, too. It gets worse, right? Yeah, you know, they, for sure. They show you what you want to see, so you think everyone looks like, yeah, right? Yeah, you don't God. see the well, and your yeah. friends kind of think what you think. Exactly, yeah, right? So, um, Which is why they're your friends, right? <laughs> right. So, <laughs> so, I, so I think that... Um, <laughs> that you know, it it appear it would appear there's this massive problem with drug addicts on the street, needles yeah. around. Mm -hmm. oh, you yeah. mentioned that the people don't want to have conventions there, right? That issue is stoppable. Mm -hmm. That you could, if the police actually stepped in and did not allow this, if it's tolerated, mm -hmm. it's just going to get worse. But what are they going to do with the person who's on the street? Just sitting there. I mean, I guess they, it could be a quality of life issue. They you, they you, tell them to go away, and then what? You, okay, so there's a couple of possibilities, right? You can't put everything into one box. So if, if people, I believe, for drug addicts should uh -huh. be sent to uh, for rehab, not to jail, uh -huh. rehab, drug rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. I think heavily. I think there should mm -hmm. be a massive, massive effort to take this mm -hmm. on the on the actual rehabilitation side. Yeah, it's absolutely. And not throwing because it does uh -huh. nothing when they throw uh -huh. them in jail. It, they, they put them in jail out, they come out and do the same shit again. Yeah. Right, right. So the right. massive amount of should be spent on rehabilitation. And then mm -hmm. also, but recognizing have a you know like when when you have like I think people don't look at mental illness. Right? It's like you have triage. So mm -hmm. when you do a triage, is this what's Causing this, you have to look at each person individually. Yes. What's causing the uh -huh. problem? Are uh -huh. they homeless because of mental health issues? Are they homeless because mm -hmm. they're drug addicts? Mm -hmm. Are they, or are they just lazy bastards? If right, they're lazy right. bastards throw them in fucking jail. That's uh -huh. what I think. Right. Right. If they're if they're having mental health issues, address that. Put them in an institution. That, but you know, it got to be the, the right. You know, they got to get mm -hmm. the right type of help. Mm -hmm. okay. I don't. I think that it's very difficult for people with mental health issues to survive on the street. I oh, think absolutely. they get taken advantage of, they get abused, yeah. okay? Yeah. So yeah. there has to be some sort of system to take care of that. I don't think the problem lies in any one answer mm -hmm. as much as not, I think the problem with some politicians, they try to, it's like they'll think like everything is one solution. We got to yeah. throw them in jail, do this. I think you look at each person individually and make mm -hmm. a decision based mm -hmm. on what the root cause is. It's almost like if you're just addressing the symptom, which is they're shooting drugs in the street, uh -huh. then that's not going to do much. Right. It's the question is why is it happening and address, go one step back and address. That's what I would, I would yeah. do that in an right. organized yeah. way. And I would not, allow i i think that just because i witnessed it happen all right and i didn't like him much back then giuliani uh -huh, but i uh -huh. watched it happen yeah where the quality of life the crime rate dropped to almost nothing mm -hmm. because it because when little crimes are not tolerated yeah mm -hmm. it starts or if little crimes are tolerated they it just it just escalates mm -hmm. up the same way in a company mm -hmm. you know the corporate 
ethics flow from the top down. If it's back yeah. up right. to the top, it goes down. Right. Right. Same right. thing happens flowing back up, you know? Right, right. right. And right. I mean, that's the thing is like, I always see the same homeless people in my neighborhood and you'll go, you know, two days and not see them and then they're back again. Yeah. And like, there's one guy who shoots, guy here. Up, same guy here. shoots yeah. up on the street and he like blocks right. the street. Yes, oh. I wouldn't, that you, to me you would be. Talking, you couldn't use the ATM I couldn't use the, the ATM. Right. Right. So that, because that he, was to shoot, me, he was shooting heroin in front right. of the yeah. ATM. So, so that, to me, the fact that that person is not either in a rehab or in uh -huh. jail mm -hmm. or in a mental institution is not, right. that, that person uh -huh. does not belong on the street and shouldn't be allowed. And I, and, and that, if it's a, a, that's a, a liberal outlook, that's saying it's really wrong, it's destructive, it's not fair to that person. That's what I was going to say. It's not fair to that person that are right. are being affected by it. Yeah. Right, yeah. right, yeah. And I think that, you know, I mean, going back to the mental health angle too, I mean, I'm really hoping that since there seems to be more of an open dialogue going on about mental health and it's becoming a little bit more acceptable for people to share that they have issues, then, you know, maybe it's going to trickle down to the people who are homeless and who have issues and people will be more understanding and there will be a better solution. Mm -hmm. uh, I suffered, just, just so you know, I suffered terribly my whole life from anxiety. Mm. Uh -huh. Really? Wow. Oh, yeah, yeah. I never, never would have never known. Never would think so. No. From a very young age, uh -huh. from the time of um, seven or eight years old, I had panic attacks. Uh -huh. And I would get these ruminating thoughts, and I, and I was scared to death to go to bed as a kid, really. Uh -huh. And it oh. was very painful. It hurt. It tortured me mentally, my yeah. whole. And mm -hmm. I, I taught to, like, to, I used math, believe it or not, to resolve. Like, I would count numbers at night and yeah. take the clock and multiply the minutes times the, the hours when I was really? you know, to try to get my, Just cause a like my, brain, mechanism, my brain wouldn't huh? stop. Right. Uh -huh. And I, and then finally, it kind of, it, it, you know, even in my early adolescence, 12, 13, it stopped when I went through puberty, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and then I had maybe one slight relapse when I was in my 20s. But then again, like, you know, I remember like, but back then I was already going fucking wild, right? So like, mm -hmm. well, I, and I was seeing, my, and I had this great psychiatrist I would go see, right? And mm -hmm. and I, you know, say, hey, oh, my, my phone's a tally. And then he's like, oh, you're passing. No, it's real fucking fear. Uh -huh. It's really happening. Yeah. Right. They actually right. are watching me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so like, is it, so, so, I, so I think that the, ang so like, I was having severe anxiety, <laughs> but I think it was justified. Right, right, when, right. Why? yeah. You know? Yeah, so how do you deal with it now? Do well, you still have I'll tell you, it? no, I, I don't. I'd still, I still, I'm still the the left, the vestige of that uh -huh. is intractable insomnia. I've never recovered from it. Is it so? To this very day, uh -huh. I can't. I sleep maybe three hours a night, uh -huh. and, and I've used that as an asset to my business and my life. Yeah, but I don't. I wish I could sleep better. See, but I cannot fall asleep at night. I've trained as a, as a child. I trained myself to not sleep. I didn't welcome mm -hmm. sleep, so I trained myself to do that, and then. Over the years, your body adjusted okay. to that. So I'm, I'm I'm one of those short sleepers, it's called. I don't require much sleep. Mm -hmm. And my wife and I have separate bedrooms. We don't sleep because it drives wow. so fucking crazy. Uh -huh. it, you yeah, know, yeah. She needs her eight hours, and I'm like up all night. Just doing, I'm up, I'm down. You know? yeah. As you get older, I go to the bathroom 84 times a night, right? Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm like that commercial. I'm like, where's that? That's stuff. I want the fucking drug, the, 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 the pomegranate juice. I was like, hey, hey. No, but, you know, so, but the thing is, does that was, and then I'll tell you the big, the big, um, moment for me i'll tell you it yeah. was when i part of my drug addiction was about that was yeah. it was quelling self-medicating against anxiety and um and depression as well i mean when when, when prozac came out i had to use it because i love the name prozac sound uh, prozac yeah, sounds i was pro, pro prozac <laughs> and, I, and so i tried prozac i started paxil i tried expect yeah. i had to try them all because i just love drugs right so i tried them all <laughs> But I, you know, but no, and I didn't like that. I found that my mouth would get dry. I couldn't. Then I had some sexual issues. It was hard right. to like finish. You know, oh my gosh, drive you crazy, uh -huh. right? You know, creating one problem for another. So I, so I had to go off those. So and then I said, well, you know, the quaaludes are better anyway. And then, and then I had a bad back. And it really, I had, oh, yeah. I actually had my spine fused. So it was an amazing oh. excuse to do as many drugs as I wanted for a bunch of, you know, my back hurts, uh -huh. you know? Yeah, and, uh, right. And then my back got better and I still did the drugs anyway. <laughs> uh, but when, but here's what, here's the moral of the story. When I, when I finally got sober, all right, it was uh -huh. about, it was 19, it was 1997, April 17th, right? Uh -huh. And I got sober and I, I was so out of control, right? And, mm -hmm. and when I got sober that, that was in the movie that day when I drove through the garage door and all right. this crazy stuff, yeah. right? And um, and then I got sober and I didn't relapse ne and I had never relapsed right and I'll drink a little bit of alcohol but I was never really in into alcohols my I like uh -huh. pills and coke was my thing right uh -huh. you know I'm like yeah, yeah whatever anyway <laughs> I really like this stuff right you know I like do a ski jump off a pilot right anyway so um, what happened was is when I got sober and I and then before that I was taking massive quantities of Xanax uh -huh. 
and Clonopin. Because I like the name Clonopin. I love the name Cl- Cl- Clonopin, right? So I would take Clonopin because I like the name. So I took drugs. I love the name of the drug. Oh all right? Gosh. So I took Xanax. <laughs> I would take Xanax to mellow me out. Clonopin because I love the name, all right? I would take Ambien to help me sleep. Quaaludes because they were Quaaludes. Morphine because it made me feel awesome, right? And then when I got sober, all right? And then, and, and so I wouldn't have panic because I was always medicating. Yeah. I had my first panic attack after being sober for about three months. And I... Called my sponsor, right? Who oh. was a sage guy, amazing guy, very mm-hmm. successful guy, right? And we we spoke about it, and, and he's like, "What are you gonna do? Like, are you gonna go back?" I said, "Never. I'm never." I, I was so over drugs. I was like, "This," and I mm-hmm. and it's really mm-hmm. weird. What I said to myself is like, "I was like, I have no choice. Mm-hmm. Like, what? I almost not that I. And it's interesting. I said this to my daughter. I said I I willed away my own panic attacks, my own anxiety because I realized." that under no circumstances was I going to turn to Xanax anymore. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I had no choice but to deal with it. So did you meditate? What did you no, do? Uh-huh. No, I just, I, I, I honestly, I just, I accepted the, I accepted the fact mm-hmm. that of what it was, was just simply, you know, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, anxiety. It's listen, you know, there's this really fine line between fear and excitement. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. And, and I think in a lot, in a lot of ways, a lot of ways I, I had really mistaken certain emotions I was feeling and physiological changes in my body mm-hmm. that were really more about being excited and then being fearful and having anxiety. Mm-hmm. And I think something just clicked in me. And I, and I, and I think this is you know, a really interesting thing with drug addiction. I don't know if you guys have ever been addicted to drugs, you know? Yeah. No. All right. So, you know, uh, and when you're addicted to drugs, it's what happens is you can go to 50 rehabs. Uh-huh. If you're not ready to stop, you're never going to stop. You could be in the best Betty, Betty Ford Hazel. It doesn't matter where you go, right? Uh-huh. If you're not ready to stop, you'll jump over the wall or you'll smuggle drugs in or the, the second they let you out, you'll do more. Uh-huh. Right. But if you're ready to stop, you're done. Uh-huh. If you're really done, you could get sober in the rooms of AA, in a church or in your own house. Uh-huh. When you're done, you're done. Uh-huh. Um, I know people that say, I got sober on the floor vomiting for four days and just saying, because I just would never, I, I, you know, you, you have this shift internally, right? Uh-huh. So when once you make that shift, all right, it's just like, it happens in an instant. And I think on some level with my anxiety, it's like it got, I made a shift. I got to a certain point, And when you're ready to make a change, it happens in a heart. In an, in an instant. It, it does. It just does. What takes a long time is all the pain and suffering you have to right. go through. I've been through 36 years of suffering uh-huh. because mm-hmm. of anxiety. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I have told the story before. I don't tell it all the time, but I, I, that's not a secret that I wrote about it in my book, but just kind of get lost in the wildness of the book, right? Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah. That, that, um, and and I, I just said, you know what? It was like, no more. I, I, I can't. I'm not taking. There's no way I'll. I'll quell it with a drug. So I got to fucking deal with it. And I just did. And, and, it, and what happened was it lasted for a couple of hours. It disappeared. Mm-hmm. I never got one ever again. Ever. Wow. Really? But what was the one I just thing that depressed. pushed you? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, what was the one thing that pushed depression. you? What? What, what was the one thing that pushed you to that point? To, to give, a, to give it up. To just give it up. Ah, oh, oh my, my values. So no, what happened with me, it was really about... Um, losing the things that I, 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 before that, when you're on drugs, you, even at any addiction, mm-hmm. you can rationalize anything. Yeah. Like, it's amazing what you can do. Right. Uh-huh. And I got to this point where I committed to something. I did something with my daughter who was like, you know, her and my, so my most precious thing in the, mm-hmm. in the world. Mm-hmm. And I put her in a car mm-hmm. and without a seatbelt and drove through a garage door. And the, the, two nights before that, I took a pot shot at the milkman because I thought it was a UFO flying through my, I had lost my fucking mind. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And, and you that, knew it. And that, yeah. And that one moment when I, you know, when that, then I got arrested, you know, uh-huh. that, 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 then they took me away and then I got, they let me out. I flew to Florida and I, you know, I did more drugs than, than uh-huh. they, than I overdosed and I ended up getting, going to a mental institution for three, cause I thought I'd commit suicide, right? You have to uh-huh. get a three day hold uh-huh. and they gave me an option. They said, either you can go to rehab or we're going to keep you for three days. And I was like, I'm not staying this fucking place. It was full of crazy people. I was uh-huh. not crazy, right? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. You know? And, uh, so they, they appealed to my larcenist side back then. They said, listen, just it was a, they brought an intervention. Said here's what you do. Just just um, just we'll sign you out, and once you go to the rehab, just jump over the wall, leave. Uh-huh. Better than this lockdown institution. Uh-huh. So I was like, okay, I'll agree to go to rehab, right? Uh-huh. So I so I had every intention of essentially. So they had a private jet waiting for me, right? Got out of this this um place, a lockdown institution in Delray Beach, Florida. Uh-huh. Jump into a private jet. They take me to um Georgia, uh-huh. right to Talbot Marsh. I drive. I have I'm. I'm 
looking in with the eye of a prisoner looking to escape as I'm driving. I'm like, oh my look God. at my exit <laughs> ramp, you know? <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, that's it. I'm at him. I'm waiting for my exit, right? And then they, they all right, sit down in this chair. And I sat down in this nice, comfortable chair. And I walked. It was pretty nice to place. I was surprised, right? And I'm looking at some bookcase. And I'm like, I'm done. Mm-hmm. And I was just, I was like, you know what? Fuck it. I'm done. And I took a deep breath. And I was like, the compulsion to do drugs mm-hmm. was lifted from me. Really? In, a, in Yes. And just wow. like that. And I had almost no withdrawal symptoms. Mm-hmm. I stayed for four weeks in this rehab, which was a freak show, by the way. Uh-huh. Another story. Um, but but the thing was, is that it, the comp- I think for me, the thought of what I'd done to someone I loved, my daughter, right? Mm-hmm. It was like the pain, I think, the ultimate pain to me. And, and that was what caused me to have a complete shift in my values. And I said, mm-hmm. what the fuck? Fuck am I? Mm-hmm. It's, it's drug- one thing if it's to you. It's another thing if it's somebody right. you love. Drugs are the strangest thing. Right. They really are. It's like when you're doing them and you're caught up in it, mm-hmm. you you um you you can't like it's almost like it's normal. You think everyone else is doing it. So when you have that shift, so that was my story. So tell tell me now, tell me your let's let's talk, let's talk about your depression. Oh man, let's talk about my depression no. story. Um, I've been I've been depressed too, you know? Yeah, I mean I think a little bit of depression is good by the way. Uh, yeah, I mean mm-hmm. I I think it makes you a more conscientious. Bit. Conscientious. So tell me a tell bit. me <laughs> tell me I don't want listen, I don't want you to you know, unless you're comfortable, but I'd like to hear tell me what you know what really your story about it. You know what? I am totally comfortable sharing my story because I'm hopeful it's going to help other people share their stories and that's really what it did with my friends when I, you know, came out about being depressed. Um I don't think I realized what I was really suffering from until I was in this awful relationship I told you about before, um, where I ended up having to get a restraining order against the guy. And I, I want to know his name. I know, oh. right? <laughs> Everybody does. You know, hate on him and post terrible things about the asshole. You know I mean? yeah. So if you want to say it, say it. If not, no big deal. Yeah. <laughs> we'll Google it. Anyway, anyway, anyway. But I think that when I was with him, I started to realize like, man, I feel so bad about myself. And I think I kind of came to the conclusion that if I were not depressed and if I felt really good about myself, I probably would have left the relationship. You know, I mean, logically, I wouldn't have stayed. And I think it made me do a lot of self-reflection and say, you know, there's something that I think could be wrong. And I come from a history of mental illness. My dad has clinical depression and his mother was bipolar. So, you know, it wasn't out of the realm of possibility for me to have it. Although, her side of the family is all clear, but you know, I there's certainly a genetic component to it. Yeah, sure. I think there, oh, I sure. think there definitely is. And when I first met with a psychiatrist, I was kind of of this mindset that, well, you know, I can't possibly have anything, and you know, and if I do, it's you know, it's not a big deal. I was, I went to the psychiatrist, kind of intimidated, and I, I hate to say this, but almost a little judgy of who the other patients are. Like right. I'm, I'm not like. I'm not them. really like them. I'm not really I'm, like them. I'm, I'm a healthy, depra- I'm a healthy <laughs> depressed person. Right, right, exactly. And I went and I was like, well, I don't think I'm depressed, but you know, I'm in this relationship, and you know, I'm having you know a lot of issues. I'm really feeling bad about myself. I'm really sad. I'm not wanting to get out of bed. I'm not really wanting to go in and do things and be social with my friends. And you know, a lot of that too is it's really hard to be going out with your friends when you know you're kind of holding this secret about this relationship that. You just don't, you you feel like not great being around them because they're in happy relationships and you want to be happy for them, but- At least you think they're in happy relationships. You think so, exactly. And <laughs> well, it, on it's, Facebook, they are. Yeah, yeah, they're Facebook, right. they are, and you know, I'm again- sure look happy on, right, online, yeah. It, yeah. It's, it's just really interesting when you get honest with your friends and your family about where you are. You. They, get, they get honest with you, and it's been right. really nice. It takes away all this surface stuff that I think is just so prevalent prevalent in our society today, all this surface happiness. So did the, did the psychiatrist um, prescribe you medication? Yes, she did prescribe me Which medication. Um, Cymbalta and okay. Wellbutrin. Okay. Um, so I was put on those two drugs and- Wellbutrin's an older one, so Cymbalta's new. Yes, yeah, Cymbalta. Um, Is it a, it's sometimes like one of those RSS, uh, um, you know, serotonin reuptake him to SSRI, right? Right, and, right, and, exactly, yeah. exactly. And you know what was really frustrating for me, and I'm sure a lot of people have felt this way, is I left the doctor's office and she was saying, like, I wouldn't feel better for at least six weeks, you know? So that fucking was- Fucking pissed me. That's what was- made me so mad. I did not like that about those drugs. I like, right. I want the fucking pills to make me feel better. <laughs> I want it to, be, right. I'm at this point, I want to feel better wh- right now. And I don't get that. Like, because theory, it doesn't make sense to me. It's like, the way it 
it works. Mm -hmm. You know how these drugs work, mm -hmm. right? They stop the synapses from mm -hmm. uptaking serotonin. It's a reuptake. Mm -hmm. So there's like the brain mm -hmm. balances, right? So the yes. theory is, is that when you're depressed, your serotonin levels drop, right? right? So low. there's two ways to go. You could have the brain release more serotonin mm -hmm. or you could block the reuptake of serotonin, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So that these work by blocking the reuptake. I'm like, why the fuck should it take three weeks? Well, and you know what? And even if it if it doesn't work, then you have to try all these other medications. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. that's what's, what was just frustrating about the process for me is, you know, I felt like I'd come to terms with the fact that maybe I had something that needed some attention and then I just didn't get instant relief. And and um, so did it did it work ultimately, the pills? I think they ultimately did work, but I think a lot of it too had to do with, you know, kind of like me coming to terms with the fact that my life is not what I want it to look like. This is not the relationship I want to be in. And just because I've invested time in it doesn't mean it's right. And, you know, I think I think that being on the antidepressants just kind of made me have a wake-up call and kind of get things together and um, have a little more confidence you have in side, myself. Do you have side effects with it? Um, I mean, I, I was a little bit tired, I would say, but, you know, I still felt more able to go out and hang out with people than I did off the drugs. But the other thing you did too, you were very proactive. You really Always. were looking for ways to feel better. Well, that, yeah, that and, was and the thing I was going to say about it too, is I think that, you know, even in my darkest, darkest times, I always wanted to feel better. Mm. And that's, you know. So you, you have a, like what they call a low, uh, you didn't have, you had a high bottom. Some, some people have really mm -hmm. low, like with depression can get really fucking dark. Mm -hmm. Like where mm -hmm. there's, there's depression, which you have, which is like treatable, but sometimes depression can get really like, you know, it's just like, this, I mean, uh, did, you, did you get to the level of hopelessness? Yes. Ever, and the, I mean, the, you know, I did. And I also think that, you know, these drugs didn't cure everything for me. I mean, I want to be really upfront about that. Like it didn't. And I, you know, still think to an extent I have treatment resistant depression, how, how which much is frustrating. Do you think that, so I assume the psychiatrist, if his worth is fucking her license, she also engaged in talk therapy too, yeah. right? It wasn't just about some sort of cognitive or psychoanalysis or some sort of whatever procedure she used. It wasn't just giving you drugs and say, see you next, you know, see you in three right. months, right? So, right, exactly. So, you, so exactly. you think that helped at all? I do think that helped. And I think one thing that actually helped me that she didn't recommend, but you know, I, I am a big fan of Oprah's and I know Oprah is a big proponent of doing gratitude journaling. And I think that was like the one key that really helped me and that I saw I had so many blessings that I didn't really think mm. I had. Mm -hmm. Cause when you get mm -hmm. into being just so depressed and you feel hopeless, you're like, God, nothing's going right. And so by forcing myself twice a day to write down three things that were yeah. going right, mm. It was like, okay, okay. It's, it's like little baby steps helped me. You know, and you did it, exercise too. A I lot. did, I guess. Exercise always been huge. Really that's important. huge. Huge. Very yeah. important. Yeah. 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 Well, I think the, you know, that's Oprah, what she's tapping into there is a, is a very, very simple but powerful self help. Mm -hmm you know, um, you know, adage about like basically that you could focus on what's wrong in your mm -hmm. life mm -hmm. or you could focus on what's right in your life. And mm -hmm. if you focus, if you spend all day long focusing on the shit of mm -hmm. life, well, you're going to mm -hmm. probably feel pretty shitty. If you focus on gratitude, it's about focusing on what's right. Right. Looking at, you know, applying a positive meaning to experiences versus a negative meaning to experiences. But, but I think that takes discipline because it's really hard to yeah. want to to feel grateful when you're feeling that low. I no mean, doubt. did you find that yeah. as well? Well, you know, I, I find that a lot more with like my, my, in the moment state like you know yeah. we, my, my wife and I came around I'm like she's like manage your state I'm like I want to be fucking pissed right now I, <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't want to manage yeah, yeah, right, I feel right. I want to feel like shit you know I, I actually use negativity believe it or not and fear as a motivator so yeah. I motivate myself often by through worrying and fear it's not the most elegant strategy but it works yeah. really well how I, so well like if I if I really if I'm trying to Let's just say, you know, I, I, in my mind, success, a lot of the achievement of success is about getting yourself to do the things that you know you have to do, even when you don't feel like doing them every day. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people, like there's things we love to do and there's things we don't love to do, right? Mm -hmm. And it's easy to do the things we like and to mm -hmm. do them, and then neglect the things that we don't. But when you want to become successful, it requires that sort of discipline to do what you don't like doing, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, we ha well, everyone has a different motivation strategy. Well, how do you get yourself to do those things? For me, you know, there's always the two sides. Yeah, there's, you can focus on if I get it done, I'll feel like focusing on the pleasure side. Or if I don't do this, my life's going to fall apart. I'll be broke. I'll be miserable. I'll be alone. I'll be insignificant. So I, I actually tap into my worst fears and my, really? my, my away vow. Yeah. And, and by doing, well, it's very common. I think, yeah. I, I just think I can verbal, I, I think a lot of people that they don't verbalize it maybe the way I do, but right. we all either, you know, move away from pain or move towards pleasure. So, right. and, and we typically both have both. Everyone has both. 
does both, but yeah. each person's got their dominant modality. Uh -huh. I'm more move away from pain, and then, yeah, I, I can motivate myself by moving towards pleasure. Like my son, for instance, my other son, Carter, right? It, when he was growing up, and, you know, I'd say, Carter, if you don't get better grades, you're going to get ground, you're going to be... Mm -hmm. No impact. Mm -hmm. That's because he does not pain based in the other pain. Mm -hmm. No, mm -hmm. but I say, Carter, do this. You get a new car, or, or you'll get a trip. Or you'll let you. oh, ah, oh, but that, <laughs> you, you, so that's that. So, so everyone is different. So, like the old carrot and the stick, right? Yeah, so, you no, have to, no, so no. part of motivating people is understanding that each person has a different motivation strategy, and one is more effective. And it's usually a combination of the two, but you got to find what their dominant was I and mean, speak to that. You know, right, right, no. right. And I think too, a lot of it was getting out of my own comfort zone and, you know, just saying to myself, I want to try and help other people with this. Like this mm -hmm. is miserable. I want, I want to talk about that. So, so, yeah. you, so you, somehow, right. Which I think is awesome, by the way, you parlayed this, right. Uh -huh. You took yeah. your pain mm -hmm. and you turned into this awesome thing where mm -hmm. you, you and your mom teamed up, right. And you have this mm -hmm. like top podcast out there, mm -hmm. right. Where you guys, you know, whether you make do it to make money just to you help people, mm -hmm. right? Right. Mm -hmm. So tell me, so how did that start? So, you know, who came up with the idea for, you know, you've been in media, right? But right. podcast is more of a younger right. generation thing. Mm -hmm. So, right. Well, well, I was, um, as, as I mentioned, I was a talk show host for a while and I loved interviewing people. I loved hearing their stories. And so I always felt I took a break when Laura and, um, my older daughter were little. Um, I became a stay at home mom. I left the business and everything like that. When my husband was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, like I say, 18 years ago, I thought at some point I may need to get back into the business because who knows how the Parkinson's yeah. is going to go. And if I do, what would I do? So I felt like what I'd really like to do is go back and do some kind of a talk show that would be helping people, really getting the good stories that people could learn from. And I, I envisioned probably doing that in radio. And then when Laura and I were talking over the years, she's like, Mom, my generation only listens to podcasts mm -hmm. because then we can listen to whatever topic we want. At any know. time we want, pause yeah. it whenever we want to. And, you know, I mean, no. I, I think that was hard for her to hear and for my dad to hear too, coming from, you know, such a big radio yeah, background yeah, that that, yeah, that was kind of a dying yeah. Well, yeah. I still hate to say that. Yeah, but, but she, but she's like everybody listens to podcasts, yeah. and then she and I started. To I listen didn't to know. Podcasts. I didn't know that. Like really? I, my son, mm -hmm. to, like I've been like mm -hmm. getting office for a few years. Mm -hmm. Do this podcast, podcast, yeah. right? And I was like, oh, whatever, mm -hmm. podcast, podcast, like, what, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. You know? Yeah. And then my son really pushed me into mm -hmm. it, and uh -huh. hey, I'm loving. It. I enjoy doing yeah. it. Yeah, I, I, love I meet, to I meet people. great people. It's yeah. really fun, right? And I know people. I think respond well to it. But it's it's interesting. So from your perspective, right? So you you approach. You said you decided you wanted to do something together. Is that how it and then Well, we, we would listen to podcasts a lot because Laura was going through this this difficult and time in her life. she was literally the best person in the entire world. You, I was but, very lucky you, to have Here's your question. So it's interesting. I mean, one of my fears for sure would be coming down with something like Parkinson's. Uh -huh. That would scare the shit. I mean, that, uh -huh. right? And right, I, yeah. And while I know that the treatments are, are radically advanced compared to what uh -huh. used to be almost like a death sentence, right? Uh -huh. Did that freak you? How, how did you handle that? Like back in, was it, was it like back? It was like around 2001 yeah. when my husband first had the symptoms. And how did he it just, start? Like all of a sudden you started shaking? You know what? It was weird. We were in the midst of an argument, not a serious argument, but, um, you know, an argument and his hand started to shake. And I thought, well, this, this wasn't, you know, it wasn't. <laughs> he shouldn't it, be that upset. It wasn't that up, you know, it wasn't something that should make him shake. It was yeah, just kind of right. like, well, you know, why didn't you put the cap on the toothpaste? <laughs> you know, it was like, it shouldn't be causing him to shake. And then. Oh, it's that type of fight. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't, a, no, it wasn't a biggie at all. Right. And, and then when I noticed his hand was shaking, it was like, all of a sudden, instead of focusing on whatever it was we were mm -hmm. fighting about, we looked at his hand and it was like, well, that's really weird. And he was looking at it. Just it just out of nowhere, just. Out of nowhere. But we figured it wasn't a big deal. And he. And did it stop then and go into remission? Yeah, it stopped. It, it, it stopped. It wasn't a consistent thing. It, it stopped. And, and uh, but it kind of came back a little. And then he talked to another doctor, a friend of ours who said, you know, maybe you want to go have a neurologist check it out. It's yeah. probably nothing. And he went to the neurologist and they didn't need to do any other tests. They just looked at him and they said, you know. It's Parkinson's, really? and um, yeah, from the other from the other symptoms. So he came home, and we really didn't know anything at all mm -hmm. about Parkinson's, and um, 
you know, I think in some ways that was good because we just sort of uh, we just sort of figured, okay, we're just going to take it as it as it comes. And, and I think we initially thought too, it was just going to be shaking. What, was there it's like was it like was it like I mean a heavy moment or would you, would you yeah you talk about it now more like logically, but at the time was it like was it a deep emotional thing or was it more just logic? You logic it out. I'll tell you what it was. I was driving down the street in in our right in front of our house. And my husband was driving toward me in the opposite direction. He had just come from the doctor's appointment. And so I saw him driving toward me and he had this look on his face that I have never seen him have before. It looked like he'd seen a ghost and he was driving his car. And I thought, oh my God, you know, I know he just came from the doctor. I wonder what Mm -hmm. happened. And um, the mortality like stares. Yeah, it was like, and and I still, I can picture it in my mind right now. And I know that that was, you know, it was, he had just, you know, left the doctor's office 10 minutes before when I saw him, you know, and, and, and then we came home and, and, uh, and he explained what it was, but we didn't think it was going to be a bad thing. And I have to say, one of the things that he has done is to really exercise and try and stay in great shape. He's doing boxing now because boxing is great for Parkinson's. He walks a lot. He walks a lot. He's done yoga. He's done Pilates. Yeah. He's done so um, basically keeping active and not becoming sedentary. Right. And and we went to the doctor with him yesterday, the neurologist, and she said, she said, I'm going to tell you something. She said, if you hadn't done the kind of exercise that you've done, and he he has kept his mind really active mm-hmm. too right. as a talk show host over the years, but she sure. said you would not be sitting Ooh. across from me in the same condition mm-hmm. that you are right now. It's the exercise and and but you and know there that. was a lot of uncertainty when he got it because they apparently can tell how fast your Parkinson's is going to progress right based on how it is the first year and we were really lucky that his has been pretty slow progressing right they said that it can be much worse than what he has right right and and Robin Williams had a different thing because Robin Williams had Louis body body disease with his Parkinson's Uh which is which is different um, but they do say, yeah, after the first year, they can tell if it goes really slow, you've got a slow progressing So it's on like, because they, they put on steroids and stuff like that. And what's the treatment for, um, L-Dopa? Is it, uh, yeah, Levodopa, he's on Carbidopa, Levodopa. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, he's on, he's on, uh, several medications for it. Right. Um, like five times a day. Yeah. Yeah. The trick is the blood brain barrier. That's the, right. the, uh-huh, that's exactly. the challenge is getting yeah. the drug uh-huh. through yeah. the, so, so, um, so they had some. Some a little bit of you know little, uh, tr- drama in that. Wow, you, you yeah. Got, but yeah. here's my here's my question: is like for everything, right? Yeah. You know, we we all have stuff, right? right. Yeah. yeah. What I love a, I love about your story is that is that you used it to like you took the. I I think this mm-hmm. power mm-hmm. in failure. I think this mm-hmm. power in mm-hmm. depression. Oh my god, I, I, think I this completely pa- right? agree with and, you. Like this power in like negative. Like it's almost like you know there's something called um you know um. This, you know you have like dry ice, right? Uh-huh. It's called sublimation, where where it skips, it goes from a solid to a gas and skips the liquid phase. They mm-hmm. call that sublimation. It's like mm-hmm. it's an artificial turn. It's like skipping a stage. It goes from one. Ex- so it's almost like there's like a, a way to, of sublimation with your with your life, where if your life gets so bad or mm-hmm. so negative, it's like you're almost stretching a rubber band, mm-hmm. and what you have stored energy there. So mm-hmm. if you can turn it. it snaps mm-hmm. back and you right. can almost right. soar to success quicker than mm-hmm. someone could without having been in that right. situation. Right. You know right. what I mean? Right. Like right. taking like, you know, like for instance, jail to where I did. It's like almost, mm-hmm. it's, it's very common in people that, that have a real huge, big, you know, like a, a negative event. They can, if they can, if you can flip that switch, mm-hmm. you uh-huh. can actually use to propel you to success. So mm-hmm. what, so when you guys started, right. Mm-hmm. So what do you think that makes your podcast so successful? I think what we have done that's been great is we we do work really well as a mm-hmm. team in terms of mm-hmm. we kind of know our responsibilities. Like I do the social media stuff for us and, you know, mm-hmm. I work with influencers to, you know, make sure that we're getting seen by a bunch of different mm-hmm. people. Um, but, mean, so let, t- let's explain because I think people have a lot of people who are entrepreneurs here. Yeah. So tell me about, I- I'd like you to tell some, give, give us your strategies. Tell okay. Me, I want you to help. <laughs> well, no, I want you to help. help people people want to know about podcasting. Yes. I want you to, I want you to, I want you to tell everyone, I want you guys to disclose your secret of how anyone could take, whether they have one or just, yeah. any, how do you like, you know, raise your awareness? Tell me your secret. I think the one thing we did at the start that a lot of people don't do is we started out with 30 episodes. We posted mm-hmm. 30 at once. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't mm-hmm. like we were going to post 
one podcast uh, and, and never mm-hmm, do it again. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, somebody somebody in so the business became, had suggested it real. that. It was, like re- it was like, wow, it's right. going to be a real we show. Put up a, we put up a bunch of them to make it look like, hey, we're in business. We're serious about I this. I like it, that. It's yeah. not I'm going to take that advice, by yeah, the way. No, yeah, no, no. We, we, posted, yeah. we posted that many. So And we had really good people. I mean, I think because I'd been in the business that I knew a little bit about who to contact and yeah, you know, yeah. I, I had you a know, lot of everything. Way, you know. a really, really good piece of advice for people to follow. Seriously, mm-hmm. guys, like, like if you think about it, it's an extrapolation into content creation. Like, yes. mm-hmm. is, you want to create lots of content. Exactly. Right? A little bit doesn't, it's, it, it gets, does nothing. It's too much, it's and too it has much, to be consistent. Right. Mm-hmm. There's a consistency mm-hmm. and also mm-hmm. like doing a lot at once. I love that. That's, mm-hmm. that's a very good point. Mm-hmm. So that, that's the first thing, right? right. And that's the so first what, thing. So what were the first 30, were they, okay, do you look back at those first things and say, like, they sucked or you love the first 30? Like, what, what, what? I, you know, I I feel like it's a mixed bag. Like I personally wouldn't go back and listen to the first 30. Yeah. <laughs> I'm scared. I like my first one. I love to see my first Your podcast first was, was Dan. Cause I love that Dan. Was right. well, I that was great. That was great. It was fantastic. Dan is amazing. So, but, so I chose him on purpose. <laughs> no, no, but, and that's what, and that's what I think we did. We, we went for people who we knew were good talkers that we could relate to that and had good and stories sort of and we were interested yeah. in their topics, right. but we also went into it with this idea that we were going to post shows regularly. Like it had to be like Again. three shows a week and we wanted advertisers from the start question do you does your audience skew heavily to female yes mm-hmm. i want more female can you give me advice i, I want more female i don't have enough female uh-huh. listeners like because i think i have this reputation as being a misogynist i'm you know i'm not i'm a, uh-huh. i am not mm-hmm. i think you guys mm-hmm. get a sense of me totally right. i am like right. not i am a lover of and a respecter of women and like right. i have a daughter who i'm more proud than anything who was like an empowered lives and so mm-hmm. but i think because of the movie yeah they you know and and it was a different time back then. It, it was, right. And even then, yes. even then I respect <laughs> he it. He tells me this like every single day. It was, day. you know. And my, it was. Listen, my mother. It was more fun. And it was <laughs> fucking A, it was fun, right? <laughs> There we go. Found it. You know, yeah. found it. And no, and let me say, my, let me just say the truth. My assistant from the movie, her real name was Mona. I saw Mona and uh-huh. she was like, oh yeah, I put Mona through fucking hell, right? I mean, uh-huh. you know, uh, you know I, mean, I, was, I was a nut. I admit that, right? So I call Mona two in the morning, Mona, I, yeah. I have a problem, right? But anyway, um, but you know, I saw Mona about a year ago too, and and she I did a big event in New York, a speak, and she came to see me at dinner afterwards as part of like a group of 20 people on the dinner. And she, she goes, you know what? The kids, they don't know. We had the best time. Mm-hmm. It mm-hmm. was so much fun. I think this whole political correctness shit yeah. in the workplace is so, it's a shame. Think about being gross. It's a shame. You know why? Because mm-hmm. like, you know, I remember like, we used to like, you know, if you liked someone in the workplace, you'd dress up for them. You'd run mm-hmm. to work. There was mm-hmm. all this intrigue in the office. You'd meet people. Now everything's mm-hmm. fucking online. You got to meet everyone through online dating and shit and Tinder. Exactly. And fucking Schminder, whatever the fucking yeah. the latest thing yeah. is, right? And, and the point is, it was kind of great. There was, listen, everyone was fucking everyone. I'll admit that. But there was no, it wasn't sexual <laughs> harassment. <laughs> Right. That was not that. That was if, how you right. met your spouse. Someone, <laughs> would, if you if you if you harassed someone, you'd be fired in two seconds. Mm-hmm. Right. In my company, you'd be fired. Right. In two, right. It was all consensual. It was fun, and I think that you're right. It was a fun. But even here's another thing: if you look back, even mm-hmm. before that, like mm-hmm. you ever watch Mad Men? Uh huh. Oh, co- of course. Like yeah. and you watch how yeah. women were treated. Now, my mom is a is an incredibly accomplished woman. So she mm-hmm. was a CPA mm-hmm. back in the fifties. Wow. Mm-hmm. Going into wow. New York, working in that type of environment yeah. and was so brilliant and well respected that she actually you know was you know had a, not an easy but she was actually un- underpaid for what she does this men that were one half of the intelligible making twice what she was making mm-hmm. back in the 50s right yeah terrible mm-hmm. thing right yeah mm-hmm. um and then when but she still was very accomplished then mm-hmm. when she was 73 before she went back to law school became the oldest woman in new york state to pass the bar Oh she won pro, bo, pro, bro, pro bono lawyer of the year, which was like in the 80s for doing battered women's charity. Wow. Mother was amazing, wow. you know? Right. Wow. And it pisses me off that I get a bad rap at women. Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. I, I, I'm like, you know, I love women. Mm-hmm. Right. I, I mean, mm-hmm. I'm, like, I'm, like, I'm like Joe Biden. Joe, I love women. <laughs> no, <laughs> you would hug you. And no, you. But, you, but you know what? Even that, I think uh, that's who he is. That's who Joe Biden is. And, I don't think it's a I don't hugging, right? I don't care about it. I don't think it's a creepy thing. Uh, politics is disgusting. Right. Mm-hmm. It, it Can't is, do anything. It's just, it's just like, I mean, everything, even t- look at Tony Robbins. Right, what right. What they're doing to Tony Robbins right oh now. Oh my what God. The fuck? What, Come on. Right, uh-huh. I know. Mm-hmm. I you know. could like mm-hmm. him, you could hate him. He's not an evil 
Oh, yeah. Jesus mm-hmm. Christ. Mm-hmm. And they go back to what he did 22 years ago before he was married to a woman he loves. And mm-hmm. he was an angel? No. Who's mm-hmm. been an angel in our life? Right, right? And exactly. They just try to just, mm-hmm. It's like America's really weird. They love to build you up uh-huh. and they love to knock you down. And, mm-hmm. I, and I think it's- And I, it can I, happen like that. Mm-hmm. What do you, let me ask you a question. So I want to get back to your to more tips because you gave me a good one. I'm like, I want to get more information from you. But I want to know, what do you think that's about though? Like, why do you think- It's like, okay, Australia's 10 times worse. In Australia, mm-hmm. they have what's called the tall poppy syndrome. Mm-hmm. That if you try to rise up, that chop, chop, yeah. uh-huh. right? Mm-hmm. But and we don't have that here. But there is some element mm-hmm. where when we res- respect entrepreneurs, there's something when so it's like there's some sort of Schadenfreude, as they call it, to it. That like when like you know wishing someone bad. It's like why do you think that's about? You know. Or do you, you think me I'm wrong? It doesn't exist. I mean, no, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, America loves to build people up and loves to tear them down. And then, but but I think we also like to see them re, reinvent themselves. True. We like mm-hmm. a second. Because like then a we second can relate story. to them. More. Yes. Because yeah. everybody needs mm-hmm. that. Everybody mm-hmm. feels that way. I, yeah. I, 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 I love the reinvention. I, I, me too. I agree. Thank God, because I'm a reinvention. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I'm the ultimate reinvention. But I think I think on some level, though. I don't know. If, see, here's, here's what I think. Maybe it's not that mm-hmm. Americans, mm-hmm. as much as the American media loves uh-huh. to rip people to shreds, because you know, on Wall Street we had to say, you know, good news travels fast, mm-hmm. bad news travels instantly, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and now it travels virally. Uh-huh. So it's almost mm-hmm. like you know, sure. it's like by the way social media is constructed mm-hmm. right now, it's mm-hmm. like it's almost bent towards negativity because mm-hmm. it increases engagement. I, I just I wonder. No, it, it, that's very true. You know? I, I mean, it's it's hard when you post positive of content. Sometimes people don't want to see that. Oh, yeah. I, you know what I always say? I say to my haters, I love you guys. Keep hating me. Right. Because every time you hate me, it's $10. Every hating thing you say. <laughs> right. Go my, it. and it's like, go right. hate, hate me. But look, okay, you gave me one great tip, guys. All right. Okay. I want, give me another. I want, so the first thing you did right, say, like, listen, you have this, you have an amazing podcast. You do. Mm-hmm. It's you are like, Number one, mm-hmm. right? It's mm-hmm. like that's no easy fucking mm-hmm. task. It's mm-hmm. a crowded marketplace. You guys are it's very you know, crowded. Seven hundred and fifty thousand. Like you're, like you're like a silent killer, you two, right? <laughs> yeah. So, no, so mm-hmm. no, seriously, you wouldn't look at you like, like <laughs> right, right, exactly. Yeah, number one in the world, you know? Yeah. Right, right, so, right. so what else? Tell me, come on, give me another secret. I, you're, I you're I'll, obviously doing this is not an accident that you guys uh-huh. are successful. It never is. Uh-huh. So, what else are you doing? I think that to start out, we just started contacting as many really interesting people as we could, and I have to Boom. tell you, like at the beginning. It was like a hundred to one. I would send out a hundred emails and be like, this mm-hmm. is who we are. And this mm-hmm. is why we mm-hmm. would want to have somebody on. We would make it personal. Or I did a lot of those myself. Mm-hmm. Um, I just tried to, you know. That doesn't surprise me. Yeah. I was doing that like bam, bam, bam. And you know, I mean. You're a salesperson. Ex- mm-hmm. Exactly. You're a closer. <laughs> exactly. And by the way, it just goes to what I say that sales yeah. is it. I anything. love sales. Yeah, well, it's, without it's sales. It's exciting. So, you, so what you did is you actually had a, a direct sales, an outgoing telemarketing and email campaign. Exactly. To make sure that you got quality guests. And then you, you turned it into a numbers game. And then essentially what you, you almost did, you wore, you wore down the market. You call enough people, you catch selling. Exactly. And then all of a sudden, right. then you, you get more credibability down. and more credibility. Mm-hmm. And, then, and before you know it, you become a destination we want to go on because you have – Traction, right? And right? For, right. for those people who didn't want to come on in the first place, they, then, you know, then we contact them again two yeah. months later, you know, three months right. later. And then, so, you know, maybe they do. So no. I you, don't give up. Uh, no, good. No. So all well, that's a resilience, tenacity, yeah. right? Those no. Amazing traits for any salesperson or entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. Right? So you would recommend for sure is don't, you know, be it bashful. Go out there. Just ask and, you know, go out to put a directed effort to go out mm-hmm. and recruit guests, interesting guests, right? And right. you can't be afraid of getting a negative response. Like most people just aren't going to respond at all. I mean, that's that's really what what the, the the reality of it is. When I would send emails out, most people didn't respond to begin with. So you have to kind of develop a thick skin with that. How? Yeah, but I think you also have to target it. And I think that the more big names you get on, then, you know, we then can add people say like, people. oh, okay, well, they went and on, then, well, it's okay. Right. Right. It's okay. I, so when, I, when, no. when people try to get me on their show, they'll always yeah. say, I had this guy, that guy, mm-hmm. that guy. I'm like, oh, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. I mean, so for me, it's more about like, if does it fit what I'm doing? Right. You know, mm-hmm. or, you know mm-hmm. for, in fact, for like the last year, I hadn't gone on any, didn't, I would go on no because I knew I was launching my own. I wanted to wait because right. I wanted to drive yeah. traffic somewhere, yeah. right? Sure. All right, so that's two great tips now, right? The first, The first tip Okay, was you released a large amount of, you created a, a significant, you almost made yourself relevant. You were a real player and you continue to put content out, fresh content, right? right? And mm-hmm. you need to put content out on social media right. too. And it's not just the content for the podcast. So, right. Tell me about that. How, what was your strategy for that? 
Um, so what I did was for every single guest, um, they have a nobody told me lesson, like their big life so lesson that they learned. Let's go about the name. We haven't okay. even touched on the name. Okay. Okay. Yes, you go for okay. it. Let's go about that. So, so the name of the podcast we, is nobody told me and everyone should at least watch it. Just listen once. Choose your favorite. What's your favorite? Okay. What's the best episode to listen to for the first one? Ooh. Choose one. Teen, Tina Seelig. Okay. Tina Seelig. Who is? She's a, she's a I'm stand- embarrassed. I like no, Mitch no, no. Albom, the guy who wrote oh. Tuesdays with Maury. I loved him. Mitch Albom Or Elizabeth Smart, the kidnap Elizabeth. Oh, kidnap shit. Had, oh really? Yeah, yeah she was fascinating. Yeah. She was fabulous. Mm-hmm. And, you know, she was talking about, like, one of her nobody told me things. We always ask, what's your nobody told me lesson? What is it that nobody told you in life that you had to learn mm-hmm. on your own? And, and one of the things she said along those lines is, that after she was kidnapped and and mm-hmm. the lesson that she had learned, one of the, the things was how how meaningful things like sunshine and fresh air and rain were to her after she'd been kidnapped. Mm-hmm. You know, nobody told her those things that, that the rest of us take for granted, you know. Mm-hmm. And um, not to have a victim mentality. Like she could have been the kidnapping right. victim her entire life. But where right. does that get you at the end right. of the day? Yeah, she said, nobody told me that it was up to me to define how I would be seen by other people. And she said, I decided I didn't after want to- After the kidnapping. After the yeah. kidnapping. She said, I decided I didn't want to be that girl who was kidnapped for the rest of my life. Mm-hmm. You know, I wanted to to move on and, and you know, Know, help people and mm-hmm. and and she's certainly done that but we worked through a lot of potential titles for the podcast mm-hmm. i mean we had dozens of them mm-hmm. and finally we settled on nobody told me because it's kind of that thing like well i think all of us have felt that like god why didn't somebody tell me that mm-hmm. you know why why didn't i know what that what was Gee, the key I, to life what yeah, what yeah, hard what, times could i miss out yeah, on yeah what could i what could i skip over if mm-hmm. somebody gave me this advice what could you know hard lesson would i then not have mm-hmm. to learn myself yes, exactly. you know mm-hmm. And and so we just thought nobody told me is a great thing because we've always everybody has those nobody told me things and I think we also have lessons in life that people did tell us but we didn't really well, pay attention to. By the way, to. so that's okay. So you know, of course, as you're talking, I'm I'm listening and searching my memory for the. No, I'm saying what's my and for, honestly, for me, it's far more. I had really good parents. Uh-huh. It's not so much they didn't tell me things. I just didn't fucking listen. Well, right. but see, here's the, the, that's what I'm saying. There are a lot of things that people tell you, but you don't pay attention you to. You got it. And then you have to learn it on your own. And then it's like, oh God, that's right. People told me life was going to be hard, you know, but I didn't really believe it but until you, it knocked on my door. But you can be told the same thing by different people and it just doesn't mm-hmm. register until it's with the right person. Like I might've been more likely to listen to advice from a mentor than I would have, you know, even from you mm-hmm. growing up. And I think that's really common for kids. Like Mm -hmm. it just takes a while for, for the right thing to hit. And so I think with this show, we have enough different guests saying enough different things with enough different experiences that we feel like people can really get a lot out of it. But a lot of them say the same thing. Like I'm struck by how many people talk about their failures and say how their failures were really, they had to go through the failures to become a success. Oh, sure. Mm-hmm. You know, and I know that's one of the things you you were talking yeah, about on your first podcast. Yeah, lessons it, are in the failures. Right. right. Yeah. Mm-hmm, yeah. Mm-hmm. But you want to you want to be the one that doesn't have the failure, that doesn't have the hard time. Yeah. Right, but that that requires I think being open about the fact that, you know, we've gone through hard times ourselves and, you know, that 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 really has been the catalyst. Like the catalyst for this really was the worst time of my life when, you know, mm-hmm. I'm looking and like, I don't have a purpose and, you know, I feel sorry for myself and I just don't know what to do with my life. And this ended up really being what, you know, I feel is my purpose. And I feel like you feel is your purpose too, is to just try and mm-hmm. help people as much as we can to, you know, achieve their dreams and be happy. I mean, as cheesy as that sounds, that's really what it's all about. Yeah, yeah, but it was also like I say to have another source of income because right. I didn't know we, what we hit that hard. My husband that, that so would be what, I, so right. what so, I would say so, going to do. Like, okay. So how did you you monetize with advertising, right? Yes, and you know, yes, it's it's definitely something we love doing, and we definitely want to help people. But we started out saying this is going to be a business, like that. That's what mm-hmm. that's what we do. She's so always treat it like a business. Oh treat yeah, it like it's, a business. It's not a hobby. sales, marketing, content mm-hmm. creation. Exactly, deli- it was a deliberate thing. Exactly, mm-hmm. and like I said, we have our we have have our roles. So, you know, with social media, I create a little graphic for everybody's nobody told me lesson and I have their picture and I make their nobody told me lesson and I have fun doing it. Mm -hmm. Um, it takes me a while to like pick the right one, but then we put that out with the podcast. We put the picture out with the podcast and then we are able to promote that picture on Instagram, Facebook advertising, Mm -hmm. you know, whatever we want to do, we do that. And then on days when we don't post the podcast, we post positive quotes and, you know, 
other people's nobody told me lessons or quotes from the show. And then we promote that. Um, in addition to that, like I said, we've had advertisers. We have, you know, reached out to people. I mean, I, any Did you brand port like, so do, Now, do you do the podcast and manage it on your own? Or do you have a company that, that you go through? Um, so we, we record the podcast and do all the editing ourselves, but, um, Megaphone is the host of our podcast. And so they have the ability to insert ads where we don't have ads. And so we get paid Mm -hmm. by that. So they usually have our pre-roll spot and, um, I decide where else they can go. And then we also do some endorsements too. Uh You know, we get approached by advertisers. Right. And then I want us to do, I've also, you know, done a couple. Who's your best advertiser? Who do you you think? Oh, Oh, we've had a lot of great ones. Um, I don't know. I, I I don't want to pick one. I don't want to pick one. <laughs> Can't pick favorites, but we and we have yeah. fun doing the live reads together. Right, we like, love that. How about how about this? Who's your favorite ex advertiser that no longer advertises with you? Like what? What did fun from the beginning? In the beginning, was there one that was like sort of a linchpin that really made? Wow, we got this person that's like. I think it, I, I liked Bomba socks. I liked Bomba socks. They sent us too. a ton of socks, and, <laughs> love and they were socks. great socks. Great yeah. socks. We love them. Yeah, Bombas. Go with us again, maybe. <laughs> I think you should buy the right. you know? Wow. So, okay. So we're, we're going over. I always go over. So you guys are really interesting. Let me ask you one, one more thing. In terms yeah. of, so one more business question here. In terms of a sustainability, right? Mm-hmm. Do you actively, like in business, in some level, unless you're always reinventing yourself and mm-hmm. trying to make yourself obsolete, you, do you guys always think like, what's next? What's our next move? What, like, how am I making this better? How am I improving this? What, how do I make it even more exciting? What's, you know, like, n- not that you're trying to like, you know, reinvent yourself as much as like mm-hmm. you're this never ending improvement and that you're always striving. What's the next big thing we can do to take it to the next. Do you have that attitude or? Absolutely. I mean, Mm -hmm. I think that's almost been a downfall for both of us is that we both just always are thinking ahead and what, Mm -hmm. who can we have next? And you know, what angle can we bring to the show? Mm -hmm. We're constantly talking about that. So 24 seven and we'd like to do a Ted talk. Yeah. We're in talks to do a Ted talk and a book book and maybe turn it into a TV show. You guys have a fight? Yeah, we've, I mean, yeah, we have. I think it's gotten better as I've gotten older. It was early 20s. My dad and I <laughs> fought like crazy. Yeah. Yeah. My father's like, you know, he's a, yeah. he's Mad Max, right? I yeah. love my dad yeah, to yeah. death. He's a yeah. bad boy. When he came, to, he worked for me. Like I own the company. Or right. I, I remember once. I my father has what's called a very high action threshold. He's uh-huh. like he's tough to sell to. He hates to yeah. buy things, uh-huh. right? Yeah. I remember once I probably made two million dollars in two days, and I went and bought. I wanted to buy ten desks for a hundred dollars a desk. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. If they're just making two million, so a thousand dollars. But he, I did it without telling. He went fucking you motherfucker. <laughs> How dare you fucking crazy? And he, like, I'm yep. done. I quit. Like, it was pretty tough. My really? dad, a tough character. Really? Like, oh, oh, my, oh. my dad did not come to the table to be friends with me. <laughs> so did it strengthen your relationship with him? Oh, yes. Oh, my God. Yeah. yeah. Oh, no. Him? Let me tell you. He was such a huge asset to me. Because mm-hmm. number one, mm-hmm. all right, I'm really good at making money. I'm not particularly good at watching money. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> I have a great yeah. person now that does it for me, right? Mark, yeah. who's been with me forever. Right? But also, you know, I employed thousands of young kids, right? Yeah. And they always wanted to borrow and get advances. Mm-hmm. They were terrified to death of my dad because, like, he literally would walk around the boardroom and, like, you know, he's a 70, 65 year old man, right? You know, with uh-huh. an IQ of the stratosphere, then with a bunch of post adolescent income poops. Like, he was such a fish out of water. And uh-huh. he's walking around, <laughs> like, at 9 a.m. with a styrofoam cup of vodka. <laughs> oh, with, my. With his 10th cigarette of the day. Back then, he used to smoke, like, he thought my dad used to smoke Kent growing up. Then he kept oh, yeah. going to like lighter and lighter and just smoke more of them. <laughs> it ended up with like true ultra light, smoke five packs a day, right? And right, and, and he'd be looking for trouble and always finding trouble. They were uh-huh. terrified of my dad. He would uh-huh. actually get physical people. Yeah. And so they'd say, Hey, um, can I um I need an advance my, my pay? I said, Yeah, yeah, go see my dad. They're like, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> so he was like ultimate grim reaper. <laughs> and you have to have someone like that in, yeah. in, in mm-hmm. the company. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And all right, so last thing. What is next for you guys? I mean, listen, you guys, mm-hmm. um, you know, you're 20. What old are you? How old are you? Just turned 29. Okay, so you're almost 30. I still have clothes that are older than you, okay? <laughs> but, but, you know, like jeans, you know? But uh, you, you, you look terrific. You look really healthy. You seem really happy, which is great. Yeah. You know, and I think, so w- w- before I won't want business, but so was this like almost like therapy for you, your own podcast? And- uh, a million percent. It was better than going to therapy. This this is my <laughs> therapy. <laughs> I mean, I get to ask all these people that I'm already really interested in how they got through their tough times, and that helps me, mm-hmm. you know? And I can listen back to their shows and be like, oh, yeah, that's 
that's what Hal Elrod did, yeah. or that's you know what <laughs> right. whoever you know. I mean, I can like look at for look for a podcast, and it tends to go with my mood. No, I mean, it, it's done the same for I, me. Yeah, yeah, I think I think it has. I think like. I've been, regardless of the success of the podcast, I think it still would have made me a happier person just having done it. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. like, it, yes, it was about, you know, we wanted to make a business, but we really at the core have wanted to help people first. Right, right, right. But it's helped me, uh, like I say, with, say who, with my said, husband. Who said, he said, who said Elrod? Hal, Hal, Hal Elrod. Elrod. Who? Who's that? Hal Elrod is a guy who wrote a book about, oh, that's, that's why about I, oh, I, I, miracles. I, I thought you said Elrod. Oh, like L. Ron Hubbard? Oh, oh no. I, mean, I, was like, I, was like, I was like, wait, we need another hour. Hang on. I got right. some Scientologists. I'm like, all right, let's go. Tell me no, about Sea no. Org. I want to know all about it. Right. I was about to go, oh, boy. I mean, oh, my God. Turn out the fucking lights. Oh, my God. <laughs> You're going nowhere. I, I'm pretty sure I've seen every single documentary on oh Scientology. My God. Yeah. We both no, have, no. but no, no, no. Uh-uh. didn't grab I, us. I, I'll tell you one great story before we go, right? So, so back in like it was gonna be 2003, right? So um, a friend of mine, he was like, you know, close friend, but kind of like partners and loosely, right? And his brother was living out here and he was an actor and he had a, a new wife and she was an actress. And, and this, my friend's name was Michael. He was very reactionary. Like he flew off the handle, you know? So his brother calls me and goes, listen, I want to play a practical joke on my, on my brother. Mm-hmm. Let's go to dinner tonight. We're going to go to the Scientology big, beautiful building where all this, it's like this massive castle. It looks like it's out of some other time, right? Mm-hmm. In mm-hmm. LA. And I want to, Tell my brother that we've become Scientologists and we're donating all the family's money to Scientology. You want to just see what he does, right? Because this guy. <laughs> so now I'm like, I'm like, oh, this is going to be fucking great. Like, he goes, just play. I said, okay, great. So we all get in the car. And now this, my friend Michael, he wasn't, like Michael wasn't always the most book smart. He was a smart yeah. guy, but so I, I, he probably wouldn't even know what Scientology was. So, so I'm like, I'm like, where are we going? He goes, oh, we're going to this place at this science. I'm like, I'm like, what? I'm like, do you mean science? He's like, why? I'm like, I, I think they go after people's families. Like we gotta be careful. We go there. So we really, he's like, really? I said, Oh my mic. I said, just whatever. We, we gotta be really careful. Mm-hmm. Cause I know it's okay to just have dinner there, but if mm-hmm. you're a part of that, they'll, they go after the families. I keep saying they don't get right. Anyway. So we, you know, by the time we get there, he's like really nervous. Right. So we go into this place and the place is crazy. Nice. Mm-hmm. It's like, you can't, mm-hmm. it's like, it doesn't, I can like, imagine it would, it's be. almost like a, like a Renaissance building. Oh my the, God. All right. And we That's walk, how they get you. Right. We walk in there and the way, and they're very nice by the way, really couldn't be nice and no pressure. Anything. It wasn't like that. No. Yeah? And we're sitting there and then, you know, about halfway through dinner and it's like, it's just a weird vibe. Right. And Michael, was like kind of twitching the whole time and finally his brother goes Michael I, I had a toast to make I want to stand up um, my wife and I we decided to become Scientologists and we're taking most of the family and he freaks he jumps up and starts screaming in the restaurant he tries to attack the waiter okay oh my god and he loses his shit complete I'm like no we're just getting we, we couldn't calm the guy out for 30 fucking wow. minutes he's running oh around freaking like we're just getting we're just getting I think two days later he was still freaking out wow. the guy oh yeah, my but, wow uh, so I'm oh, glad wow. I, I have a problem with that whole thing, you know? No, um, yeah, no. I don't You're like glad that. we're not Scientologists. I'm glad. You're right. <laughs> I would be friends with one, no problem. Um, I just, you know, I think there's issues there, you know? That's, a, that's another podcast. That's another podcast. <laughs> that's another episode. Guys, you're awesome. Thank you. You Thank are too. You. Thank you for coming on. It was really enjoyable. And please tell all your female, I want more women to watch okay. me. Hey, I, we will. We will. I really promote think that. I have a, a lot, lot of, I, yeah. I, you know, my, I want to be yeah. my wife. My wife is brilliant. Yeah. She's really smart. Mm-hmm. And, you know, she's mm-hmm. really smart, right? Uh-huh. And she's, you know, has a lot of great views. Uh-huh. And she really, I think she speaks to um, all across generations. But yeah. she's not like, she's more of the uh, behind the scenes type. We're partners in our mm-hmm. business. Mm-hmm. And she mm-hmm. runs a lot of the business. And she's, mm-hmm. and she's, you know, I couldn't do it out. But mm-hmm. she's not the front person. She's the behind yeah. the scenes person. So mm-hmm. we got to. You got to push her out into the front a little bit, you know, because mm-hmm. she. Mm-hmm. I think people would love her, and uh, and she's got a lot to offer. So, yeah, yeah. As do you guys. You guys are amazing. Thank you. Oh, would you come on with us? Of course, I would. Oh, when I, next time I'm in San Francisco, right. I will. You, I will it, absolutely positively stop by. You can do it by phone. Oh yeah, we well, only no, do we phone do, interviews. But we, do, we do come to say. Oh, you, you only oh, do. Yeah, we, we only do phone no, interviews. We not only do phone interviews. Well, we would love to have you in the studio. No, well, the well studio. we do we come to most of the time we San Francisco is our favorite place. Oh, well, I think, there, so I think next you time need to there, come. Yeah, we yeah, would love to have you in the studio. I will. That would be great. Right. Sounds good. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye, man.